Well, good morning and welcome to Alverstoke Evangelical Church's Sunday stream. Um, my name is Colin, I'm the pastor at the church and this is... Carol. Who is my wife, if you hadn't <laughs> guessed that already or knew it. Um, we're a group of Christians, we usually meet at Bay House School, but at this point in time we can't meet there. So this is the best way that we can have to meet together. It's worth bearing in mind that we do have um, coffee room chats after the service. And if you want more information about that, do email um, and we can give you details or include you in those so you can participate. And it'd be good to have some of you perhaps not been to those join us because it is good to talk to each other when we've been separate as we have. Now, as we're looking today, we're looking at this series of uh, living that's intense. Um, hopefully the series will hang together. But last week we were looking at um, the people of faith in the Old Testament, how they had no fixed abode. They were living by faith when they died. They didn't receive the things um, promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who, sh who say such things show that they're looking for a country of their own. They've been thinking of the country they have left. They would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And they are described as those who lived in tents, which is where we get the... Um, title for these songs from and from what we're looking at over this week. So we're going to sing a song now, mm -hmm. which will reflect that. Carol's going to introduce that to us. Yeah, so before we sing our first song for this morning, I just want to read some verses from Hebrews chapter 4, starting at verse 14, and it says, Therefore, we have, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's, thr God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to, find, to help us in our time of need. So I just wanted to re read those verses out because it, isn't it great that we have a God that we can um, approach God's throne of grace um, and we can approach that with confidence um, and we will receive mercy and his grace in our time of need. Um, I don't know how your week's been, whether it's been a good week or, or not such a good week, but I think it's good to remind ourselves that we have a God that we um, can approach. He is somebody that we can turn to and ask for help. And it's important that we do that during our time of need, but also when things are, are going well, to remind ourselves to, to really come to him and to worship him. So our first song today um, reminds us that we are not alone. Um, the, the verse goes like this. It says, we are not alone for Christ is here. Emmanuel, our God, come near. We're not alone for to our world. Jesus has come, eternal word. And, he, and as he speaks, our souls laid bare, naked, ashamed. Sin is made clear. And yet he clothes us in his love never alone christ is with us is with us so let's sing this song together to remind ourselves that we are not alone but christ is with us Come 
words uh, reflected your own trust in this Jesus and what he has done for you and we're going to have now an all-age slot Colin Buchanan we've imported all the way from Australia mainly because his first name is really good um, but he's going to be introducing us to uh, Super Saviour I think is the song he's going to be singing if it's not then you'll be surprised <laughs> if it is then you will think oh that's great and he'll also and quote a few Bible verses as well as part of that. So please enjoy and uh, hopefully it'll make you think about our Lord as well. There is a lot that we can control and a lot that we cannot control. But I wonder, do you know who controls everything, who knows all things and nothing takes him by surprise? I think you know the answer. God. And in fact, there's a, there's a Bible verse about that. Psalm 90 verse 2 says, from everlasting to everlasting, forever and ever, you are God. Now, I want to sing a song called Nothing Takes God by Surprise, because nothing does. All right, here we go. In the beginning, God spoke a word, and that's how the world began. part of his wonderful plan and nothing takes God by surprise no no that's your bit nothing takes God by surprise no no that's it he is sovereign he's in control nothing takes God by surprise to chance. That's why we call him Lord. Because nothing takes God by surprise. No, no. <laughs> nothing takes God by surprise. No, no. No, no, no. Now, I thought of something else, something from the Bible, because God is in control and Jesus, God's son, says something wonderful to his people in Revelation, in the book of Revelation. I've got my Bible here. It's another part of the Bible to read. Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. 
Jesus says to his frightened people, I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever and I hold the keys of death. Whoa, how precious. Did you notice that Jesus said that his people had to do something? They had to look. Yes, that's right. And when they looked, they could see that Jesus, who used to be dead, was alive. That's right. So we look to God and that life that he lives becomes our life by faith. So look to God and believe and look to God in his word. That's so important. We should do that all the time. And look to God by praying to him. We need to learn to stop what you're doing and pray to Jesus. Stop what you're doing and pray to Jesus. Stop what you're doing and pray to Jesus. Mighty, mighty Jesus. When you're laughing, <laughs> pray to Jesus. When you're crying, <laughs> pray to Jesus. When you're bored, whatever pray to Jesus mighty mighty Jesus when you're noisy noisy ah! pray to Jesus when you're cranky mm, cranky pray to Jesus when you're hmm, naughty Pray to Jesus, mighty, mighty Jesus. When you're ow, hurting, pray to Jesus. When you're uh, uh, frightened, pray to Jesus. When you're... Uh, 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 when you're sleepy... Uh, Sorry. Pray to Jesus, mighty, mighty Jesus. There's a chorus. Big, big, good, good, mighty, mighty Jesus. Big, big, good, good, mighty, mighty Jesus. Big, big, good, good, mighty, mighty Jesus. Mighty, 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 mighty Jesus. He's mighty and he's good. How precious. And we should pray to him right now. Let's stop what we're doing and pray to Jesus. Will you pray with me? I close my eyes to help me think about what I'm saying. Our dear Lord and Saviour Jesus, our dear mighty, mighty God, we praise you because you are from everlasting to everlasting. You are the first and the last. Nothing takes you by surprise. Mighty Jesus, you died, and look, you rose again. Help us to look by faith, to look at your word, and to look in prayer. We pray all these things in our Saviour, Jesus' name. Amen. I like that verse in that last one. When you're sleepy, pray to Jesus. Wait a minute. Hey Siri, I've fallen asleep. We're now going to read from the Bible, and it is from John's Gospel, chapter 1. And we are going to be reading verses 1 to 18. However, here is the catch. We are not reading them 1 to 18 straight through. We're going to jump around. And the reason for that is just there's a couple of repeated themes in this um, passage, and I've chosen for us to join them together. So it comes a little bit more obvious, perhaps, and a bit different to those who are listening. So 
We're reading from the New International Version, John's Gospel, Chapter 1, <clears throat> and uh, Carol and I will alternate and tell you which verses we are reading from. So verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Verse 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Now verse six. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Verse 15. John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Verse 10 about Jesus or the word. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognise him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. Verse 16. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in close, closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Well, good morning. We're in part two of our short series that takes place over this summer holiday, if it is a holiday for everyone. And we looked last week um, what David Stanford did with us from Hebrews about how the people of faith recognised that they were living in tents, that this was a country or a world that they were passing through, and that actually they set their minds and their hearts on a city whose builder and whose foundation was God himself. And so they had this sort of attitude to life that and though this life is important, it is a journey actually for those who trust in God, a journey towards the home of God and to be with him. So that's what we looked at last week. We called it life, uh, living life that's intense. And I want to start just by mentioning how impermanent life is. Now that may seem pretty obvious to everyone, but as we get stuck into John's gospel, I think we'll see that Jesus has very clearly taken on, in one sense, the impermanent type of life that we ourselves experience. Now when I was looking for something on the internet, I came across this. This is the only policeman in the Derbyshire Constabulary who was ever killed on duty, P.C. Joseph Moss, or P.C. 35, who after chasing a pony and trap and um, arresting the woman and the man who were both drunk in charge, and during their attempts to subdue the pair of them, because they were getting violent and abusive, the man pulled a revolver and shot P.C. Joseph Moss. And he died from his wounds the next day. And uh, for some reason, that memory has been rejuvenated fairly recently. And here are police cadets up in Derbyshire who've committed themselves to look after a gravestone that has recently been put up in memory of this man. Um, he died in 18, 
79. He was relatively young, aged 26, but nevertheless, it's quite unusual for a gravestone to be put up that long after the man died to presumably replace the previous one. But notice what the text has. You, hopefully you can see my mouse hovering around there on the screen. Life is uncertain. Death is sure. Sin gave the wound, but Christ the cure. And uh, it just struck there. Life is uncertain. And all of us are in that situation. We don't know when it will end. We don't know if we've got many years or a few years. Um, the one thing we can be sure of is that we will either die or um, be alive when Jesus returns. Life is transitory then. Life is uh, impermanent, impermanent. And the life is full of risks, some of which we can manage, many of which we cannot. Life is uncertain. Death is sure. Now, when it comes to the person of Jesus, our passage in verse 14 talks about the word became flesh. Perhaps if you've not heard John's Gospel read before today and were listening to the reading as it took place, you would it would not be unusual for you to think, what on earth is this word and what on earth is this writer going on about? It certainly isn't the easiest of passages to uh, pick up with just a cursory reading. But a few things are worth making a point of, that here's the one through whom all things were made and in whom was life. And that life, even the darkness, even evil could not overpower or suppress it. It was a, a light and a life that was inextinguishable. And yet when we get to verse 14, I think the word does become much more understandable because now he has become a man, he's become flesh, he's become visible. And I'm sticking to the word flesh because I think it has important aspects to it in order to uh, understand what John is saying. The word who is God has now become a man. And the word who is, is now a man also. In this happening, nothing is lost of his nature as God. Um, the early verses said, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And now that word who was God is visible and has come among people in the flesh. He has become one who experiences the impermanence of bodily existence. God is now flesh and bones, blood, tendons, organs, soul, the whole human being. And as such, like us, he is experiencing the fragile nature of what it is to be human. Now, this is my first point, and we're going to look at three separate points under this. There's the text that we're focusing in on today. That's from the English Standard Version, how the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And I want you to notice that this is the creative word God became flesh. He is the one who is described in this passage as creating everything. Um, we can look at that through the use of a similar word right the way through these early verses. Everything through the word, word became to be. That's the word that's being repeated. Um, without the word, not one thing became to be. So everything that we see has come a result of his creative power. And there isn't one thing that uh, is created that didn't come apart from him. So I hope that makes sense. The one who has become was, was life. The one who has come has life in him. And then we read also in this passage about a man appearing. And the man John who came as a witness. And the reason that I've called this the creative activity of the word is because not only has the whole world flowed out from his uh, mind and power and creative genius, but what is being described in this passage is also coming from him and from his father. Even the man who appeared to witness to the coming of Jesus and to prepare the way for him is is 
been described as one who appeared or, or came to be. And the world through the word, as we've seen, became to be. And he gave the believers the right to become children of God. And the creativity of God in this is not only giving them the right, but actually the ability through the work of God to actually become sons and daughters of the living God. And then we read, the word became a human being. So there's all sorts of things going on in this passage that speak of the creative activity of God, of his rule over everything, of his involvement in human history from the beginning, now in the events of the coming of Jesus. And in this passage, the incredible thing is not so much that the word came into the world, rather that he came in this way. He came in the flesh. The word has not changed, but the word now exists in the flesh. So the statement that starts off our passage, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God, is now being followed up by the word became flesh. Now this doesn't mean that um, God or the word transitioned to man. Instead the word God became flesh without ceasing to be the word God. As one person put it, what emerged out of the word was flesh. No mixta, mixture, no change in the word, a full union in which nothing is taken from the divine and nothing is added to the creature. Now this becoming flesh is incredible. It's never been seen before. It's a unique manifestation. God in the flesh. It means in this introduction that the most significant thing is not that Jesus was God. Rather the amazing fact is that God is now also a man. That's what this is talking about. That is its focus. Out of this flows the whole of the rest of the Gospel of John. That is what by meant by the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The creative activity of God in his son, as revealed in the passage, has become a man as well as being God. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The word became flesh. Now, the word became flesh and that means that in the human body, Jesus, the son of God, was vulnerable and impermanent. He is in a corruptible body in that sense that it's aged from the moment he was conceived in Mary's womb and he's in a body that is easily destroyed and um, with events that have recently gone on uh, some things I've read about things that you'll be more familiar about because of the news and because we're British um, I've watched a couple of films about the massacre of Chinese in Nanking um, a horrific event in which some 300,000 civilians were slaughtered in an extreme binge of violence and aggression, um, probably unmatched during the Second World War for one incident. You may remember 7-7 where people were going to the office on a normal day and where bombers set off their devices in three separate locations as a consequence of which 56 people never did arrive at their office never did after this day go back to work we've seen the very sad and horrible events surrounding the death of pc andrew harper he never saw his tomorrow when he interrupted three burglars in the midst of stealing a quad bike and his life was taken from him. And then, of course, the most recent news with the events in Lebanon, where that huge explosion has taken some 150 people at the time that I'm recording this message. But the death toll may well be much, much bigger. All are reminders of how easily and quickly life can be extinguished. How fragile and impermanent it can be. That one minute we can be going about our business 
and the next minute we could be gone. And Jesus has taken on a body like that. The word, the word God, has also become the word man. And he's taken on the body of Adam because he is a son of Adam. His body was that of the fall and he was born into the sphere of darkness of a world that actually was in rebellion against God. And into this fragile place he came for our sake. Now with all the questions about COVID, one question I've not heard anybody ask was could Jesus have caught COVID-19? Now apart from the fact we don't know if COVID-19 existed back then, the fact that Jesus took on flesh like us is, means that he had the weaknesses and the proneness to illness like the rest of us. Potentially, if COVID had been around, he could have caught it because that is what it's like to be a human being. Um, we're none of us born invulnerable to the dangers that are around us and it was no different to Jesus. So he comes into a violent and jealous and deceitful world where life can be treated so cheaply and life can be taken so quickly. So the words flesh, Jesus' flesh is vulnerable and impermanent and that is the remarkable thing that God the Son should take on that body and be a man and still be a man. Um, he was also physically living among us. The word dwelt among us. There was something very physical and material about his taking on flesh, not only in terms of his person, but also in his work. He was to become the carpenter's son. Um, he was the son, so it was thought, he was the son, so it was thought of Joseph, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, and noticeably the son of God, says Luke. And the, the word physically lived among us, I should have put that heading a bit earlier, but it doesn't matter. But notice uh, what this meant for the people who saw him. They didn't immediately think this man was from heaven. In fact, they were they almost rejected that notion, as you can see here. At this, the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, why well, is this not Jesus? I went to school with him. Well, it doesn't say that. I inserted that. He's the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know. How can he now say I came down from heaven? His physicality is very much emphasised there, not only um, in the fact that they're talking about him, but you've got people who know him from his youth and know his parentage. And they can't just can't see that he can be any more than just an ordinary flesh and blood man with relatives just like them. But this emphasises that physically he was very much among them, one of them that he could be referred to as that even though these guys are stumbling at the thought that he came down from heaven. Um, so he's so much a part of their life physically and in other respects um, that he's simply one among all others. Now, in translating he dwelt among us, that's the ESV by the way, um, other people have translated this, or um, he dwelt among us or pitched his tent. So there's a link with last week's talk, and that will connect with next week a little bit as well. Another translator, he took up residence amongst us. The word tabernacled among us. There we have uh, an emphasis upon the, the living in a tent and living for a while among us. He lived for a time in our midst. So th these are all being spoken of Jesus. And it's the last ones there that strike struck me, or the ones that refer to a tent and a tabernacle, um, because they speak of a temporary residence, that this actually wasn't his home. And as the passage says, as we're being told, he's come from God and it will end with him going to God. But he's tabernacled amongst us and he's lived for a time in our midst. Now, if you know a little bit about the history of the Jews, you will know that they lived for many years with a tabernacle in their midst. 
and there uh, in symbol in symbol God dwelt amongst his people and they they were all around the outside so he, quite literally the tabernacle was there in the middle that's just a brief picture of it um, diagram of it so the fact now that we find Jesus being referred to tabernacling as it were amongst them seems to echo what was there that in that tabernacle God was present and in fact God revealed his character in the cloud and in the fire and revealed his glory in that tent and now Jesus is here being described by John in a very similar way as if God now is amongst his people <clears throat> he is present and the glory of God is visible in Jesus as he tabernacles with them. So there is this visibility of the glory of the word who is the son from the father. And it has strong overtones of this past. And just as that tabernacle would not be permanent, it would be replaced by a temple in due course. And um, so in due course, Jesus has come to be the presence of God and to be God amongst the people. Let's move on. The words glory was visibly among people. Now glory is one of those difficult words that if we stopped right now and I interacted with you and said what does glory mean you would probably struggle. But glory has the sense of magnificence, of brilliance, of splendor and that this was what they saw when Jesus was amongst them. The very person of God lived out in plain sight for all to see, clothed with skin and bone, flesh and skin, um, mentioned that twice, walking vulnerably among those who should recognise him for who he truly is. Yet they don't, or they won't. I wonder where you are with Jesus. Here is your creator and my creator. You weren't here apart from him, nor was I. We've been given life. And there'll come a day when our breath will cease to be moving in and out of our lungs. And our time here will finish. But here amongst them was God himself. And he's only here for a short time. He uh, was about 30 years old, as we was said in uh, some of the conversations there with Jesus. And he ministered for a further three to four years after that, um, after living just an ordinary life. And yet while he lived, he shone so brightly with the character and the personality and the love and the power of God that people really should have known who he was and who he is. And you and I should know him too. We should come to trust in him because the Gospels bear evidence to him being the maker of us all. Here we have, it's not but that clear on your screen, sorry about that, but the glory of Jesus was displayed in a particular way in John's Gospel in that there's a series of signs, demonstrations of loving and compassionate power transforming situations and people's lives that um, shout out as to who this person is. And that began with his first miracle at a wedding. And what Jesus did in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. The first of the signs. There's going to be more signs and they too will reveal his glory. But this is the first sign through which he revealed his glory. Do you get the drift? So through this book, you, are, you and I are being shown the marvellous character of Jesus worked out in the, in the few signs that John considers necessary and helpful for us to put our faith and trust in Jesus. It's seven or eight, depending how you count them, depending if my memory is correct. But the, the, those things point out clearly that he is who he is. These are better than any sat-nav. These are like those riveted up signs on the motorway, big and huge telling us this is where Jesus is, exit your current life 
and you will find um, your Lord and Saviour. So uh, these signs revealed his glory. They revealed who he is and it was seen. It was visibly seen amongst people. It was not done in a corner. Isaiah spoke about him. I'm again quoting from John 12 here. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him years before it even happened. So Jesus' life is a remarkable life in that it was written about beforehand. It is a fixed prehistory who Jesus is and what the reaction to him will be. Um, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their uh, hearts so that they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn and I would heal them. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. So the, his glory was clearly seen and John makes reference to that. And because of this, because of this one, this word who is God, who is now word in man, um, or word man, because of this, we too can see the words glory. We are told in the New Testament that the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ. The gospel displays it. We have four gospels, um, written accounts of Jesus, within which is the message of who he is and what he's come to do and the event of his death and resurrection that offers salvation for any of us who will turn to him and the gift of his spirit to enable us to live lives pleasing to him and to battle with sin. Um, this one's life and the magnificence of who he is and what he did has been clearly displayed in the face of Christ and it's described here as a creational event for God who said let light shine out of darkness made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ and therefore since the, the knowledge of God's glory is displayed in the face of Christ we should pay careful attention to the Gospels in particularly, where Jesus is seen up front and personal. And the good news about Jesus is where his glory is seen today and in him. And we're meant to contemplate that, we're meant to think about that, we're meant to fix our eyes on Jesus. He's meant to become the new focus for our lives and the continued one that we look to for our power, for our help, um, who we cry out to in trust, asking him to help us in the difficult circumstances of life and thanking him for the good things of life. But he has taken on a body of flesh so that it can be visibly seen amongst people, the glory of his father and the glory of himself. But he has a flesh that will enable him to suffer. The nails, when they were thumped through his arms, found no greater resistance to their force than any other human being. The man who whipped Jesus prior to his conviction and his sentence to be crucified didn't know any more resistance or resilience in Jesus's back and to, in his skin to the whip than any other person because he was flesh and blood like us and when he was beaten about the head with a rod and people mocked him as a saying who hit you he bruised and bled like any other person did he came to offer himself and to suffer and to be sacrificed for us and he is the way by which we might come to know God he is the one who suffers the hatred of men and the wickedness of men and on the cross takes the punishment that we will 
have to endure unless we trust him, the one who's paid the price for us, if we will trust and follow him. So the God word, um, or the word God, as the God man hung on that wooden cross, sometimes called a tree, and there as a man, he died. He had taken on this body for our sake. He had become one of us and entered the, our world as the God-man out of love for a rebellious humanity and in order to deliver us from the punishment we deserve and to rescue us from the consequences of our wrongdoing and sin. He came in amongst antagonists, enemies and people who would not or could not see who he truly was. Though his glory was bright, they shunned him and hung him out to die. And so upon those who rejected him came judgment, a foretaste of what will be the case one day when a final judgment takes place, when there'll be a separation between those who've trusted and followed Jesus in this life and allowed him to be Lord and master of their lives between them and those who've never taken a second thought for him or if they have, have chosen not to follow him and have lived to this life rather than for a future with him. And so as we come towards the close of this message, I just want to make some application from what we've looked at um, apart from what we've already said about trusting him. We too walk this earth in the flesh. We too are here for a time and for a purpose. Our days are numbered as it were. We are heading for a city that is not made by human hands. We are born like others and so we're frail, vulnerable, weak people whose lives can finish so quickly. And we await a new creation if we've trusted in Christ, when we'll receive new bodies that will not decay or grow old. But in the meantime, we can suffer because our flesh is vulnerable. And yet that suffering, just as, it, as Jesus suffered in some respects, has a purpose. We're told in 2 Corinthians 1 that the suffering that we endure and the comfort that we find in God in the midst of that allows us to comfort others in their suffering. And we're also told that we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body, that impermanent body that one day we will leave. Thirdly, we are a visible presence of God among people as those indwelt by the Spirit of God and who share or participate in the divine nature, as Peter puts it. For if we are believers, then the very Spirit of God dwells in us. We, like this, are physically present living among people. And they look at us and think we're no different to anyone else, but actually within us throbs the very life of God. Jesus. And that should give, uh, uh, give room for all sorts of good works and kindness and gentleness and love and honesty as we dwell with other people. And then finally, by way of application, we're not the word God, but we are being transformed into the word man. In the image of Christ himself is the objective that God has for us. And if we're believers and followers, then we need to be obedient and submissive to our master and saviour. He's not just a man, he's, he's the creator of all and sustainer of all. And our lives are to be lived to reflect his. Let us therefore, as we come to the end of this message, seek to look more intently at Jesus, to see where his glory shone out, to see that even in John's Gospel, chapter 1. That through him and as we gaze at him, we might become like him. And that we might be transformed from one degree of glory to another. 
or transformed into his image with ever increasingly increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Let's pray. Dear Lord our Father help us to be amazed and pleased and glad at what you have done through your Son. Jesus thank you that as the Son you chose to take on flesh Lord, it's incredible that you are both the word God who made everything, but you're also the word man who is one like us in so many respects, and yet without sin. And thank you that you took on that body so you could be bruised, so you could suffer. So the things written about you beforehand, both explicitly and implicitly through um, the imagery of sacrifices and uh, the coming to you in the temple, in the tabernacle might be fulfilled in your flesh and body hung on that tree and Lord we'd ask that our lives might reflect your glory that we would when we suffer grow in our appreciation of you and grow in our characters and Lord we ask that we'd recognize our frailty and learn to depend on you day by day and if some of us don't know you Help us to call out to you today that in uh, our corporate frailty we may recognize we need you to rescue us from this short time here so that we are prepared for a life to come knowing you and in your presence. And we ask these things and thank you Jesus for what you've done. In Jesus name. Amen. Right, okay, um, thank you for that Colin this morning for opening your work and um, God's word up to us. Um, we're going to finish uh, with a song and the song um, that we, we're going to finish with is in fact one that we would quite often maybe sing at Christmas time um, but Colin loves singing Christmas songs throughout the year. <laughs> yep. So the song that we've got is from the squalor of a borrowed stable. And it just reminds us that Jesus came uh, to earth, uh, born in a stable, um, a virgin's birth. And um, it just goes through that, that story that we know so well that we sing about at Christmas time, but is a reminder of what Jesus, what God has done for us. And it's great, first of all, to remind us of um of where we're going you know we're on this journey aren't we we're we're living in tents and we're on this journey and we're heading for heaven and i'm just going to read verse four out to to us just to remind us now he's standing in the place of honor crowned with glory on the highest throne interceding for his own beloved tis his father calls to bring them home then the skies will part as the trumpet sounds, hope of heaven or a fear of hell. But the bride will run to her lover's arm, giving glory to Emmanuel. And that's great to remind us of, uh, of what is to come, um, that Jesus will return. So, um, yeah, so it, um, have a good week, everybody. I um, hope to see you at the coffee and chat. So I would not really encourage you to do that because it's a lovely way for us all to connect to each other, even though we're not able to meet together um, in, in person. So I would encourage you to do that. So, But of course, there is one more thing we need to do um, before we go, Colin. Uh, I'll mention so. knife groups. Oh, you're going to mention knife groups? Yeah, okay. if um, over this Jesus. summer period, if your life group isn't meeting or if you've never been a part of a life group, and like would like to join one then perhaps contact me bear in mind that um, we're away as a family from um, 13th to the 26th of August so um, we will be running one the, on the 14th but not on the 21st but you can contact Andy and he'll try and sort you out with a group if you wish to do that okay so um, stay close, stay close to, to Jesus, Jesus and, and wash your hands, hands and enjoy singing. <laughs> Bye. Bye. From the 
the squalor of a borrowed stable by the spirit and a virgin's faith to the anguish and the shame of scandal came the savior of the human race but the skies were filled with the praise of heaven Shepherds, listen as the angels tell Of the gift of God come down to man At the dawning of Emmanuel King of heaven, now the friend of sinners Humble servant in the Father's hands Filled with power and the Holy Spirit Filled with mercy for the broken man Yes, he walked my road and he felt my pain Joys and sorrows that I know so well Yet his righteous steps give me hope again I will follow my Emmanuel. Through the kisses of a friend's betrayal, he was lifted on a cruel cross. He was punished for a world's transgressions. He was suffering to save the lost. He fights for breath. He fights for me. Loosing sinners from the claims of hell. And with a shout, our souls are free. Death defeated by Emmanuel. Now he's standing in the place of honor Crowned with glory on the highest throne Interceding for his own beloved Till his father calls to bring them home Then the skies will part as the trumpet sounds Hope of heaven or the fear of hell but the bride will run to her lover's arms Giving glory to Emmanuel Yes, the skies will part as the trumpet sounds Hope of heaven or the fear of hell But the bride will run to her lover's arms Giving glory to Emmanuel